Hey everyone, it's the Doom Dog. I have been back from my hiatus and Dalton and I did a playthrough of Quake 4. We finished up our playthrough of the game recently. As usual, that means that it is time for a review. Join me as I take a look at Quake 4. We played the PC version of the game. The Quake series is a rather interesting one. Quake 4 is a direct sequel to Quake 2. Here's how that works. Quake 1 was a standalone game, and the only things that are canon to it are its expansion packs. Quake 2 was not being developed as a sequel to it. The story and world have nothing to do with the first game. Quake 3 is primarily a multiplayer shooter and is, once again, its own standalone thing. Quake 4 picks up the story of Quake 2 where it left off and continues it. Unlike the three previous games, Quake 4 was not developed by id Software. Instead, it was developed by Raven Software, who was known for taking id's engines and making their own shooters with them. This was the case here. This game was built using the Doom 3 engine, before being eternally damned to the Call of Duty mines. Fuck you for that, Activision! Raven was known for making a wide variety of excellent shooters, but how was Quake 4? Let's take a look. As I mentioned, Quake 4 follows up on the story of Quake 2. It begins shortly after where that game leaves off. If you have not played Quake 2, and you should, an officer talks about what happened in that game as part of a meeting planning to strike back against the Strog. There was not a lot of story in that game, but it is nice to get a refresher for what happens in that game. If it's been a while since you last played it, or you played this one before that one. The death of the Macron at the end of Quake 2 has left the Strog in disarray. At least for the time being, the Marines are using this as an opportunity to push forward with a second wave against them. You are part of that second wave. You play a character named Matthew Kane. He is known to the other soldiers around you who see you as something of a badass. The story begins with Kane crash landing on the surface of Strogos. You wake up and speak to the soldiers nearby to regroup with your squad. Following up the story of Quake 2 is a strange idea because that game barely had a story at all. That cannot be an easy task, but Raven does do an admirable job here. There is a lot more story in this game than there ever was in the first game. There are a lot of cutscenes spread throughout this game, and they go a long way to building on what little foundation the first game actually had. As for whether the story is actually good, that is much more difficult to judge. There are certain memorable things about this game story-wise, but there are problems as well. Let's start off with the good. There are multiple moments in this game that are memorable. It has some genuinely well done cutscenes and story moments. There is one particular cutscene that stands out more than anything else in this game. If you do not know what it is, I will not spoil it for you, but... I remember the first time I saw this, it was genuinely shocking. This game does environmental storytelling extremely well. Stop during your playthrough and take a look at all the weird and fucked up machinery melded with flesh that the Strog have built. It will leave you wondering what it does and what it all means. What really stands out above all else is the body horror. This isn't even a horror game, and the Strogos environments are still some of the best body horror you will ever see in a game. Having said that, the characters are immensely forgettable. They are so forgettable, in fact, that you will probably forget their names in between one play session and the next. The moment-to-moment -moment storytelling is not hard to keep up with, but it is difficult to find too much of a reason to care about any of it. How are you supposed to get invested in the characters and what happens to them when they basically have no personality? 
that really is how this game's story is. The levels are full of environmental storytelling. There are some incredibly memorable sequences, and everything in between them is forgotten the moment that you turn the game off. Is this story good? I do not know. Yes and no? I don't think I can give a definitive answer on that. Perhaps the easiest way to describe this game's story is to say that it has its moments. This game was released in 2005, right in the middle of the transition from the 6th generation of consoles to the HD era. In fact, this game was a launch title for the Xbox 360. It has been a long time since it came out. And let's be honest here. Most of the early Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 games were not much more than upscaled 6th gen games, which begs the question, how does Quake 4 hold up? Well, Quake 4 was built on id Software's engine built for Doom 3. This is definitely not a case of a PlayStation 2 looking game upscaled to high definition. Doom 3 and Half-Life 2 both set new benchmarks for what graphics could be and were far more advanced than anything else out on the market at that time. The Doom 3 engine was arguably the most powerful engine at the time and Quake 4 puts that engine to excellent use. What Doom 3 and its engine excelled at more than anything else was lighting. The lighting in that game was astounding for its time, and it still holds up pretty well 17 years later. Quake 4 is no different. The lighting in this game is simply gorgeous. All these years later, it is impressive just how well this aspect of this game and its engine still hold up to this very day. Still. We have some more realistic stuff, especially with ray tracing, but no other game from that year has lighting nearly this good. Beyond that, it holds up pretty well graphically as well. Quake 4's environments are still fairly rich in detail and numerous moving parts. Sure, by comparison to modern games, it is not nearly as densely packed with detail, but you get this game running at modern resolutions and all the little details packed into the environment shine through. It still looks pretty good and I would love to see a proper remaster of this game that would get it to hold up even better. As I mentioned, there is a lot of fascinating body horror in this environment and you probably worked out that this means that the art design is also pretty damn good. This game is packed with strange alien machines and computers spread out all over the place, and it makes them fascinating to stop and explore. I found myself doing just this more than once in my playthrough of this game. The art design combined with the excellent lighting really helps this game hold up surprisingly well over time. I have very little to complain about graphically here, but I will tell you this, I was playing from my own physical copy of the game, and I could tell you that it does not work properly without a mod to fix it. For whatever reason, if you boot it up normally, it will load with no textures and without lighting. It results in the game looking pretty ugly as sin, and I know the Steam version is no different. I installed a mod called a tweaker that can be used to fix this problem. I will leave a link in the description below to it so you can get it working right as well. How is the sound design then? Well, none of it is outright bad, but it is more of a mixed bag than the graphics are. First off, the music does not come close to living up to the excellent soundtrack of Quake 2, where you had some awesome heavy metal soundtrack that is worth listening to outside of the context of the game, I struggle to recall a single track from this game. Don't get me wrong, none of the music in this game is bad, it's not distracting, it's not annoying, it serves its purpose just fine, but none of it sticks out. 
The big problem is that it stands out like a sore thumb when compared to Quake 2. Quake 2 has a legendarily good soundtrack. It is a hard act to follow up, sure, but this seems so much worse than it actually is by comparison. The in-game audio, however, is excellent. The various machines that you pass by in the hallways of Stragos are full of all kinds of computer buzzing sounds and everything in between. It sounds cold and calculated, which fits well with the Strog being a machine race mixing with flesh. They do not seem to care about environments being clean or sterile. They seem to be more concerned primarily with function. And the audio fits that pretty well. The gun sounds are good too. They have power and weight behind their shots, as guns definitely should. It can make them more fun to fire when it is done right, and that is the case here. Shotguns are nice and bassy, explosions have a powerful boom, and fast firing weapons sound like you're ripping your enemies to shreds. The weapon audio is excellent here, I like it a lot. Finally, the voice acting of this game is nothing to write home about. No one turns in a bad performance in this game, you will not be laughing at how terrible it is or anything, but none of it stands out as particularly good either. As you would imagine, this does lend itself to characters not standing out. It's not the only reason that they don't stand out, but it certainly doesn't help. The voice acting is passable, it's just not much more than that. This is a first person shooter and the gameplay is truly what matters here. How does this game play? Well, it is a fairly typical shooter for its area. It is a rather linear corridor shooter affair. You move through corridors shooting enemies and picking up health and armor power-ups to keep yourself going for longer. You pick up ammo and new weapons the deeper you get into it. The first thing that you should know is that it is a slower paced game than the first game was. You walk at a slower pace than the breakneck one that you did in Quake 2. This was typical of the era as we saw the rise of console shooters in general and Halo in specific. I do not see the big deal here, but other people seem to find this as a deal breaker. Having said that, there is a certain point maybe halfway through this game where the movement speed is increased and it does feel more like Quake 2 in terms of pace of combat as a direct result. While I do not think the game is boring before this happens, I cannot deny that it does get more fun when this happens. It is appreciated and it provides a nice change of pace when it does happen. Most of the enemies that you fight in this game are reworked enemies from Quake 2, though they have such a higher polygon count and level of detail, it might take you a bit to figure out who they are. Much like the first game, they are fun to fight, and much like the first game, the AI is nothing to write home about. They are smarter than they were in the first game, as they do not tend to stand still, so there is that. Still, they are fun to fight. Most of the arsenal from the previous game returns in this game. It brings back versions of the blaster, the shotgun, the grenade launcher, the rocket launcher, the machine gun, and the hyper blaster. They pretty much all work exactly how you would expect them to, but there are new weapons as well. The lightning gun from Quake 1 and 3 is in this game. The Nail Gun from Quake 1 shows up here, and there is a new weapon called the Black Hole Gun. The Lightning Gun works just like it did in Quake 1 and 3. It fires a continuous stream of lightning for as long as it has ammo, and it deals good damage. It is fun. The Nail Gun looks different than either version in Quake 1, but it still rapid fires nails at the enemy, and the Black Hole Gun is this game's replacement for the BFG. While I miss the BFG, this weapon is a lot of fun too. It deals a hell of a lot of damage to the enemies hit by it, and it drains life instead of just hitting for big damage like the BFG does. I like it. This has something resembling a weapon upgrade system as well, but it is not well thought out. You do not buy new upgrades or earn them through regular use. 
of weapons. Instead, there are just random points in this game where your fellow soldiers will tell you to pull out certain weapons and they will upgrade it in some way. You could get more ammo between reloads, increased damage, or homing attacks. It is awkwardly implemented in this game and feels poorly thought out. The weapon upgrades are useful though. This game has vehicle sections and they range from decent to kind of annoying. The hover tank here is pretty fun to use and fight enemies with. It's fun to control once you get the hang of it. It does tend to slide a little bit as you might expect from a tank that is levitating above the ground, but I like it. This is the first vehicle section of the game. This game also has more than one section where you are on a turret mounted on a vehicle. You have no control over the vehicle and you are basically just protecting it from enemies and incoming missiles. These sections are fine. They are not great. They are some of the weaker parts of the game, but they are not annoying. They do not tend to outstay their welcome either. They are fine. The mech section, however, does get annoying. You need to fight off giant spider machines that are more powerful than you and the game railroads you through some narrow hallways as you fight these things. This is not fun. It is annoying. It does not control all that well either. You cannot quick turn and you cannot really sidestep either. Trying to avoid or take down incoming fire winds up being you fighting with the controls and this winds up being the low point of the game as a result. Quake 4 does not have the replay value that it once did. Quake has always been known for having good multiplayer and deathmatch was fun in Quake 4 just like it was in three previous games. Nowadays, however, you'd be hard pressed to find a game against anyone. You would probably have to arrange it yourself, but the campaign is fun to revisit occasionally. I play it less than Quake 1 and 2, but I have beaten the campaign multiple times on both PC and Xbox 360. I have no doubt that I will play through it again at some point in the future. All in all, Quake 4 is a fun experience. Graphically, it holds up surprisingly well. The lighting is very good. The enemies are fun to fight. It has a good selection of weapons to fight them with. Quake 4 gets something of a negative reputation from a lot of Quake fans, but I feel that it is undeserved. This game is awesome. I would definitely recommend picking it up and playing through it. You have two options for picking this game up. You can get the PC version, which you can purchase from Steam or GOG, but there's an Xbox 360 port as well. It is functional, it is playable, and that's about as kind to it as I can be. It does not run well, and there are pretty obvious compromises to how it looks. The best part about this is that it came with an excellent 1080p 60fps console port of Quake 2. Unless you simply have no other choice, I would recommend the PC version of the game. I will leave a link in the description where you can pick that up, but do not forget the tweaker to make it run correctly. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. This game was a lot of fun to revisit for you all. Comment below and let me know. What do you think of Quake 4? Do you like it like I do? Or do you find it dull like many others do? If you could like this video and share it, that would help me out a lot as well. Subscribe and ring the bell to make sure you get updates from this channel. Talk to you later, everybody. Doom Dog out.